not overreacting to a bad day is a, the first step in avoiding a crisis, <laughs> right? And acknowledging, okay, this is unfortunate, might even be really bad. Yeah. But um, can I just do my job and can everybody else do their job and put their head down and manage through this bad day? That's what we do. And the next day is better. And hopefully the next day after that is better. It's uh, one of my definitions of needing to move to crisis mode is do we need people to do a different job in order to manage through this? And so when you think of a true crisis, like a um, um, natural disaster. Yeah. Everybody can't just do their job because it's it, it's become impossible. And so who needs to be making decisions in that situation? Who has enough authority or power um, to make decisions when it, it's not obvious what the right answers are? That starts to construct what the crisis structure should look like and the crisis team needs to look like. Welcome to Being Understood, a podcast where we explore what it means to be understood and talk to communicators who do that for organizations. I am joined today by my co-host, Bess. Hi, Bess. Hey, Liz. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. And also joining us today is our founder, Kathy Thunheim. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate the chance to be here. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah. Looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. So what we like to do is find out a little bit about everyone. Did you know you wanted to go into communications since you were little? Or is that something that came about like during yeah. college? Or tell us, tell us how you got into totally communications. Totally backed into it, truth yeah. be told. Um, I was a really good math student in school. So when I came out of high school, my mother thought it would be a great idea to be an engineer. Um, back in the 70s, there weren't very many women engineers. I think she thought I should be some kind of a you know trailblazer. And I appreciated her confidence in me, so I thought that'd be a good idea. Um, but I also was just the recipient of an incredible thing called an internship of Girl State. Girl State was a program that a lot of um, school districts had where somebody got picked to go and spend a week pretending to be part of the government. And I was picked from my high school, and at the end of it was told that I'd been selected from all these young women to get an internship the next summer. I actually thought it was a joke. I actually thought it was a joke. Yeah. But I showed up like they, the letter told me to, and my internship was in the office of the governor of the state of Minnesota. I worked for his speechwriters, uh, did doing research, pretty you know very first level stuff. Mm -hmm. But so at age eighteen, I had this opportunity to see how powerful effective communications could be in painting a picture and. Um, creating aspirations for something. And it stuck with me. I started school in engineering the next fall, but by the end of my sophomore year, had, had realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I went back and got my part-time job back at the governor's office and worked all the way through college. Wow. Who was the governor at the time? Wendell Anderson. Okay. Just passed away a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, wonderful guy. He used to introduce me by saying, Kathy's a political science major. And then I would <laughs> laugh and say, whatever that is. Um, but he gave me great opportunities, um, mm -hmm. instilled great confidence in me as a young woman, and uh, I will be forever grateful. And you worked with him as governor and as a senator, so you got kind of a multitude of experiences right, there. Right, and um, unbelievable opportunities. Um, when he was appointed to the Senate, when um, Fritz Mondale became vice president, it created this shuffling of chairs, and the net of it was, um, Wendy Anderson went from being the governor of the state of Minnesota, very, very popular, to an appointed senator um, for two years, which Minnesotans really did not like, that, that, they, that seemed like this sort of sweet deal. Yeah. So again, at a very young age, I was assistant press secretary for um, a national political figure who had a lot of controversy. So again, I, I learned some of my crisis communications work early, early in my, early in my career. <laughs> then you had a long stint on the corporate side, Yes, being a client. Yes. I, I like to tell people who are involved in public policy that I had an early, early opportunity um, and found it in some respects so frustrating that I went to the private sector and I spent 12 years uh, first at a small company that got acquired and then at Honeywell, which was based in Minneapolis at the time. And I yeah. went from being a manager in the corporate PR department to to being the vice president of global public relations you know, over a 10 year period. Great experience. Loved every day mm -hmm. of being on the inside of a corporate organization. And it was an organization that was going through enormous challenges. 
um, reinventing itself, spinning off big parts of the company. When I joined it, it had 92,000 employees. Um, when I left 10 years later, it had 52,000. Wow. So lots of spinning off, lots of selling things, lots of acquiring too. Yeah. Uh, but we became, as the CEO described it, we were the nerve center of this corporation and explaining lots and lots of critical challenges. Um, and I had an incredible team around the world that I had a chance to work with. So again, just incredible opportunity at a pretty formative time in my career. So then after Honeywell, what was next? So there were, after we did all that reorganizing, um, I had an incredible team of people that we had built at corporate comms. And frankly, it got kind of boring because we had done all this exciting spinning off right. and changing. And we found ourselves coming up with a lot of cool ideas and a management that would say, no, just wait for the next crisis. You right. guys were, we were invaluable in crisis, but they really just wanted us to be quiet. Yeah. And, and so here I had this talented group of people and one of them actually came to me and said, you know, I have an idea. I think we should, um, jump, you know, get out of here and start an agency. And we took a number of months meeting every Tuesday at the Egg and I to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I finally went in and pitched it to the head of the company, the corporation, and said um, that we were going to leave. If they wanted to be our first client, that would be OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I went back to the team and they said, what did he say? And I said, he wants to think about it till tomorrow. Yeah. So you should all go home and I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they went for it. Uh, and so we did. And true story, one of the first um, articles that were written about Thunheim was in the New York Times. It was the front of the business section. And the headline was, when your boss becomes your client. And it was a story about our decision to come up or create this agency as people who thought like clients, but had decided to start an agency. And that it is a true story that for the first three or four years of the company, everything that came to us was by referral. And I think a lot of it goes back to that. So I always joke with people, you know, this media relations stuff can really work. Right. <laughs> Especially really if you can get work. a New York Times article. It can that really make really it really works out. Exactly. Exactly. So no, a very fast start, learned a lot had the opportunity to be surrounded by incredible colleagues. And uh, and then our second client was Target. Mm -hmm. And that came about, again, because of a relationship of somebody that we'd worked with at Honeywell who um, suggested to Target at that moment that they were just getting ready to start opening stores and um, didn't really have the right agency partner. Called and asked if we would you know, come down for a meeting. And I said, I think I can fit it on my schedule. <laughs> And so we went down and had this mind-blowing meeting with the head of marketing of Target. Yeah. And that began an, another 10-year relationship. I think we opened, I don't know, 1,500 Target stores around the country during the course of that relationship. So again, after the work of working in public policy for a little while, 10 years in corporate, mm -hmm. and then having a 10-year relationship with an incredible company like Target and retail, um, our agent just got off to a really, really fast start and mm -hmm. had a chance to learn a lot of really important lessons about the power of communications to help organizations get things done. Yeah. And that was, what, 33 years ago? We started 33 years ago. Yeah. I try not to remember that. Too <laughs> it makes me tired. <laughs> it makes me tired. But, you know, like every other kinds of organization, every other part of the economy, it's changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, what we get paid to do, what clients value. What we've learned through the course of it, though, that there are some sort of core values mm -hmm. around really effective communication that I think we've built over the years into um, the few methodologies that in my mind anyway are kind of the core to what Tunheim does that adds value or creates value that, that clients um, appreciate and kind of come back for. And so it, it, we can tell stories about all kinds of different clients, but some of those core methodologies keep coming back around. And one of them is certainly the thing that I know you guys have used to to um, kick off some of these podcasts, and that is taking responsibility for being understood. Yeah. What does well, that mean to yeah. you? Let's talk about it. Yeah, it is um, it is my way, and I think, it, I hope it's our collective way, of respectfully putting the responsibility for effective communications back on the client. There was a time, and I think there are still times, when organizations think it's their public relations team's responsibility to you know, garner support. And and my observation, and I hope what we've built in this organization is a, is a self-respect for what we do yeah. to say we're really effective at projecting exactly who you are. 
client mm -hmm. or a leadership person or a political figure, we're really good at projecting honestly who you are. So if you're doing something socially redeeming or valuable, yeah. you should want to be understood because people will want to be, be supportive and, and you'll be successful if, if you're trying to do something that is socially redeeming. I always joke, the only people who don't want to be understood are criminals. They, they don't want people <laughs> to understand what they're trying to accomplish. Right. But I think anybody who's trying to do something that they believe is a good thing for community or for their customers or their shareholders or for, their, for society, um, being understood takes a lot of the resistance out of your way. Right. Uh, and so I, I like to use it as a way of saying, we're going to help you be successful. Let's make sure we understand what you're trying to accomplish and that other key stakeholders who know you or, or could, be, could affect you also understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges of getting people to understand that they need to be understood? I think there's a, there's a great confusion that happens when you're in a position of authority and um, you um, make the mistake of believing that that translates into um, support. Yeah. Um, um, and so I think um, helping, helping people in positions of power and authority understand how tenuous their position sometimes is. In the mm -hmm. absence of support, there's only one way for power to be useful and that's for it to be used in a kind of a, of a um, it, it's sort of a dynamic of power as opposed to being a leader and bringing people along because they understand what you're trying to accomplish and they agree with what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so I, I, I think very rarely are people in authority, whether they're heads of companies or political figures, I don't think most people intend to misuse power. Yeah. I think they misunderstand mm -hmm. the nature of power. And being understood is, I think, a respectful way of reminding people that um, it, it, you should take responsibility for bringing along the people that you want to support you. Why is that hard for clients to do and um, harder to be understood today than maybe yeah. 30 yeah. years ago when Tunum was started? Well, you know, the first part is, and this has always been true, but it's probably truer today than it's ever been, and that is um, everybody's busy. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> has a life. Um, everybody is not sitting around waiting to understand what I'm going through or what I'm trying to accomplish. And even once they understand it, it might not be that important to them. So there's there's understanding and there is um, context for being understood. Like is what I'm what I'm trying to accomplish really important right now to anybody but me? And if the answer is no, then you have to reset your expectation um, for um, who's going to come along with you. Um, I think, so So the first is everybody's busy. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also that um, what's at stake for a, in a particular given situation, there's a great deal of difference between what's at stake for a person who's the leader of an organization and somebody who's maybe, you know, in the first level of um, an organization. One of the things that I, that I say in a lot of my work with ex senior executives today is never assume that the people at the first level in your organization yeah. even feel like they're on your team because there's so much distance between what you see and the way you're seeing it and what they see and how their how their days yeah. are, are organized and so taking responsibility to bring along the people in your organization um, making sure they understand what we're trying to accomplish um, is something that should not be taken for granted. You are also known as an advisor to leaders, um, not only as a counselor, also in governance and a lot of different yeah. um, topics related to leadership. When you think about um, that, having a seat at the table mm -hmm. at, at a leadership team, you also talk and talk often about how important it is for communications to have a seat at the table. Yeah. And given what we're exploring on this podcast, um, why do you think that's important? Why is it a management discipline that you yeah. think leaders need to prioritize, especially if there's any form of change that they're trying to yeah. navigate? Yeah. Well, and the short the short version is the world's really complicated, <laughs> yeah. and um, and I think most successful leaders now 
have a healthy anxiety about whether they're doing a good job communicating to their stakeholders, yeah. especially if the stakeholder map is complicated. You know, how do you keep people on both sides of political dis uh, disagreement on the same page? How do you keep, I mentioned it before, how do you keep in your major corporation, your CEO making a lot of money and you're talking to first line employees in a retail establishment, how do you relate right. and have them feeling like they're on the same team you are? That's a that's a serious communications challenge. It's about how do you connect, what language do you use, what filters are you having to work through and understand what filters they're working through to get to you. And so I think um, what I like to try to convey when I'm at those tables with leaders is how well do you understand the communication challenges that we've got here. And it doesn't take very long for most of them to reflect that they probably haven't thought about it as much as they need to. Yeah. And I think you can overcomplicate it sometimes and then, then they can get all discombobulated because they're overthinking it. Yeah. But I think there's a fine line between not having thought it through enough and not really understanding who needs to hear what um, and how effectively are we doing that. So I think it's, a, it's to me, it's as much about uh, effective strategy as the strategy itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes it can be the thing that thwarts your strategy because right. you had a really thoughtful strategy, but you didn't communicate it well, or you yeah. went out of order in the stakeholder yeah. audiences who got it. <laughs> Nothing worse than people finding out something in a newspaper that, you know, as an employee, I should have had the benefit of first or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And really thinking through yeah. the cadence, the stakeholder audiences, how do they need to hear something in order to be on good receive? Right. Um, right. All of those kinds yeah. of I think about the situation, the examples, I won't name companies, but a, a situation years ago where we had a major corporation that was going to make an announcement that was a fundamentally going to change their organization. Yeah. A whole bunch of people who were employees the next day were not going to be employees. Yeah. They were going to be employees of a different company. And it was a kind of industry where that employee loyalty is critical to their success. And so they were really worried about how do we tell them what's happening and then tell them what's going to happen after that fast enough that we don't lose a bunch of key people. They're going to get they're going to get recruited by competitors who are going to like swoop down as soon as our news goes up. And so we had to put together this very elaborate process of what's happening and who needs to hear, hear about it in what order. All of this is in the spirit of who needs to understand this, right? right? Mm -hmm. And um, we developed every piece of material and the whole strategy. And then the night before it happened, we called in the communications people for that organization and said, here's what you have to announce and you have to do it in the morning. We thought it was critically important for the credibility of the organization that their own comms team do the work. We thought that was important to the understanding of it. Um, and I'll never forget how appreciative the comms people were that we let them do their job yeah. when it mattered the most, but there was no way for them to have done the preparation because of the confidentiality that was required. So it isn't about us. It's about how effective is the strategy, the communication strategy. And um, sometimes it's really complicated, yeah. but it matters to take that much care with doing it right. And yeah, we do that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been in part of many teams where we're prepping it and handing that off. Yep. And um, I know there's always a moment of why didn't I get to be part of this? Yes. But as soon as it is explained, it was to protect you. Yep. But we try to think through all of these things. Now, what questions do you have so that yep. you're able to you're step in? Right. And I think it's an important step to for leaders also to think about what are you asking your team to do because yeah. um in order to see a situation clearly sometimes objectivity is really important and that's what an outside partner can yep. bring yeah 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 i think that's right especially when you know the news that you're getting ready to break has the, it's going to affect a whole bunch of people's careers it's pretty hard for them to be objective in the middle of all that and, and frankly working 12 hour days to get it ready in that last minute. That's what people like us are paid to come in and do and be able to mm. see it clearly, understand what needs to get accomplished and then get out of the way. Right. Mm -hmm. let, them let them take it back. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit throughout this podcast about crisis communications. And, oh, yeah. and I love talking to you about crisis communications because I think your take on it is so fascinating. So let's talk about that. I know the one thing 
that you always bring up is crisis versus bad day. Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. There are many bad days in the course of anybody's career. Uh, There shouldn't be, unless you are, you know, um, in the um, crisis management business, it shouldn't be what happens to you very often. You guys, I mean, please jump in here because you guys have all been a part of these too. Um, Not overreacting to a bad day is the first step in avoiding a crisis, (laughs) right? And acknowledging, okay, this is unfortunate, might even be really bad. Yeah. But... um, can I just do my job and can everybody else do their job and put their head down and manage through this bad day? That's what we do. And the next day is better. And hopefully the next day after that is better. It's uh, one of my definitions of needing to move to crisis mode is do we need people to do a different job in order to manage through this? And so when you think of a true crisis, like a um, um, natural disaster, yeah. Everybody can't just do their job because it's it, it's become impossible. And so who needs to be making decisions in that situation? Who has enough authority or power um, to make decisions when it, it's not obvious what the right answers are? That starts to construct what the crisis structure should look like and the crisis team needs to look like. And um, the objective of crisis management is to get out of crisis to move as quickly as possible back to everybody doing the jobs they were set up to do or maybe the next version of it, depending on how significant the crisis is. And I think what happens too often in these situations is there are people who are total junkies for the uh, the adrenaline that rush right. that you get managing crises that they just kind of keep showing up in crisis mode. And pretty soon you're worrying about, you know, ordering snacks into the crisis center and getting art put up yeah. and more comfortable chairs or, you know, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, okay, wait a second. I think we're supposed to be trying to get out of this <laughs> mode and get back to some version of real life. Um, so I, I, I bring that orientation in part only because we've all seen it, right. where the organization never seems to come back out into in a, into a healthy kind of way of thinking about management. But but yeah, you're right, Bess. The first thing is checking ourselves and saying, is this a crisis or yeah. is this a bad day? Because we have a lot of people who call us and say, uh, we have a crisis situation. And you want to be able to say, actually, you don't. Yeah. Actually, you know, like, not to, and again, I think you need to do it respectfully. Yeah. Oh, that sounds challenging. Let's kind of unpack this yeah. and figure out. Yeah. And one of the keys is if you can say, so what's the decision structure for navigating this? And if it's exactly the same as it was the day before the crisis, then to me, that's a really good tip that we're probably talking a bad day. Mm-hmm. We're probably talking a bad day. I don't or know, it, might be your an, experience it might be an issue that you have to manage. It can even be something that's on the horizon that they're anxious about and worrying about, right. but it's not actually a crisis. Right. This is an issue that you have to get organized and manage and manage all the way through. Yeah. Um, but to your point, are the people going to be in the same chairs? Yeah. Do they know their role? Yeah. If they do, um, then it's probably something that yeah. we can help you feel very organized and on top of. But you don't have to have the frame of mind as a leader that we need a team to manage this. Right. And then we need the other people who are also managing the organization, which is another thing I think right. we teach really well to organizations is if you're in a true crisis, there also need to be people who are outside of the crisis team who are running the organization. Managing the and too right. often, I think another misstep that can happen is everybody thinks um, they have to thinks be on the crisis, be on yeah. the crisis <laughs> team because it's really important. And that right. is really important. But yeah. what are you going to be on the other end of it? And if right. nobody's been running the organization, that I think is where yeah. you can be led down this yeah. path of one of my constant first, One of my crisis. earliest lessons, and I want to hear from you guys about kind of your lessons on crisis stuff. But one of my earliest lessons was a long time ago at Honeywell. And I think it was a financial related situation. I don't remember. But there was much... Um, executive flutter about who needed to be on the crisis team and it was all suits and um, I was there because I could write and then but there was like no support yeah and I said can I just make an observation you know we're going to be doing this work over the weekend does anybody here this is back a long time ago does anybody here have a key to the copy room 
Nobody. I said, so, okay, we don't have anybody here who knows how to get <laughs> any place where we're going to need access to equipment. It would be yeah. like saying we're going to have a crisis team and nobody is on the IT team. Yeah. I mean, you, today we wouldn't do yeah. that. So I think sometimes you, we learn the lessons we learned the hard way because we looked around and realized, oh, crap. You know, yeah. <laughs> there's nobody yeah. here to do this. But I think, too, the, the story that y- your illustration, Liz, kind of reminds me of the situation and it goes back to the bad day thing. Sometimes when that Friday afternoon call comes, it's from a comms leader yeah. or a mid-level person in an organization and they're defining it as a crisis because it's landed on their desk on Friday afternoon. <laughs> but if you can you know, take a deep breath and ask some questions and step back into it, the organization that they're part of has the opportunity to manage it as a bad day. They just, it, they got stuck with it. And so from their vantage point, they don't have the power to fix okay. it or to manage it. But I think sometimes by helping them, just talking through that and talking about here's a way the organization might want to think about it. You just give them the opportunity to get back under control and think about how to manage the situation somewhat differently, which might include saying there's going to be a story tonight. Yeah. I don't think there's anything you guys can do to yeah. change what's going to be on the news tonight. So let's at, at this point, it's four o'clock, you know, or whatever. Let's regroup tomorrow morning and talk about what this is. And oftentimes it turns out it doesn't need to be worked on over the weekend. It needs to be worked on for the next period of time. You know, another one of my lines about crisis is very often crises is um, a a necessary change happening at an inconvenient time. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes crises happen because an organization needs to deal with something and it hasn't and it doesn't want to, but it needs to. And so then external events trigger it and but it was work they were going to have to do at some point. Right. Just turns out they don't get to choose the time anymore. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. Well, in your time owning a communications business, as you said, went from typewriters yeah, right? <laughs> to now we have AI yes. and like all kinds of technology changes that yep. are making our job shift faster and faster, which is both fun and um, challenging because- Or terrifying if you're me. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm with you. <laughs> but with wanting to help clients be understood, you know, there are more channels and more yeah. mediums that we have to do. What gives you hope about communications in this time where it can be kind of harder to even know if something is official communications or not? Yeah. But yeah. what gives you hope about the next phase of communication. Well, this will sound um, probably arrogant on our collective behalf, but I really have hope that organizations that take responsibility for being understood, again, if they're trying to do something socially redeeming or positive, um, if they try to be understood, they will be successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it gets harder because the, the mechanisms of doing it are moving faster and faster and faster. But I truly believe that that um, good intentioned work that's understood by people who benefit from it will be successful. And so to me, it's new tools are being made available all the time. How do you harness them for good? And it doesn't mean that there aren't you know, forces out there that use them for ill. And I think we have to keep working at the regulatory frameworks and all those other right. things yeah. that, that protect us. But to me, it's just there's more and more opportunity to tell great stories about important things that are good for people or can benefit people. And um, that's the that's the way to put our that's where to focus our energy. Um, and yes, be an advocate for the responsible part of it and the regulatory frameworks that have to be there and so on. But I, um, I, one of the, even before I worked for Wendy Anderson or while I was working for him, I also did political campaign work for Hubert Humphrey, who was another politician of that era, vice president of the United States. And he was famous, uh, famously called the happy warrior. Mm -hmm. And he used to say, I'm an optimist because I don't really see the point of being otherwise. And I always come back to that when I think about this, that it would be relatively easy to fall into being a pessimist, yeah. but I don't really see the point. <laughs> so yeah. I think I keep coming back around and saying, are there positive things about this technological kind of these wonders that we're seeing around us? And the answer is absolutely. I was just at the University of Minnesota Hospital this morning doing a tour and seeing just unbelievable things that oh, are being done to to 
treat people and you know curing disease. I mean, the, the capacity of the human race to do yeah. uh, amazing things is very inspiring. And I think our, our piece of that is making sure inspiring work is well understood. Yeah. And things that are trying to go in the right direction for the right reasons get a chance to be successful. Yeah. And that's that's a good calling. I'm good with that. I'm good yeah, with that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that is a cool part about our team, too, is we do have such different experiences and we're all excited to share those experiences with each other and help yeah. each other learn. Yeah. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and so bring that to clients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So they, yeah. they benefit from various perspectives and expertise yeah. and yeah. Um, making sure that we're really thinking about those end audiences and then who can inform that. And sometimes they're part of this team and you've yeah. always had a very nimble approach mm-hmm. to how we think about um, team. Who so team? who else needs to be part of this team to make sure that we're thinking mm-hmm. about it through the lens of how those right. um, audiences need to right. receive the information and I yeah. think it benefits the client. Yeah. Ultimately. And I think, I think having a sensitivity to once you get to know a client and figuring out, who's actually able, who on our team is actually able to be sort of the truth teller to that person. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's me because of my title, but a lot of times it's not. Sometimes it needs to be somebody else who's much better at picking up how that person takes information yeah. um, or hears information. Um, and that's one of the fun parts I think about getting to have clients that we work with over a period of time to realize, you know, there's a way to optimize what we do for this client yeah. and have them really feel heard and really feel supported. Um, and Every time that happens, I'm always sort of sometimes surprised by, you know, where the click is really happening is between those two people. And I think we should see where that goes. Let's see what happens with that relationship. So that's really cool, too. Yeah. Well, and I think another cool thing about this time in communications history is that um, depending on what a client is trying to do, various people here are more valuable to that client than others. Like Mm -hmm. um, if you are at a leadership level, you're trying to navigate a really complicated situation. There's nobody I'd want on my team more than Kathy Thunheim. If you are trying to navigate videos on Instagram or on TikTok, (laughs) I wouldn't call Kathy, but I would call our producer who we haven't brought into this yet, Leo, who knows a ton about that stuff. And Leo's the one I'd want to talk to about how we use video and audio in a way that's compelling. And so we've got a a broad range of skill sets, but depending on what you're trying to do, there are different people Mm -hmm. who should be part of that discussion. And we're very dedicated to having the right people in that room. And so that's where a lot of the fun happens. It's fun when it's when you feel like you've got just the right kind of a team jam going on something. So it's really cool. Really, really cool. So you can call Kathy about TikTok, but she's going to hand you up. (laughs) (laughs) I'll do you a favor and not charge you for any of my time on this topic because I can't help you. And in fact, it's something I actually like to say sometimes with clients with us. Well, you know, are you going to be able to be at this meeting? Honestly, no. (laughs) What you what you really need is not me. You need somebody who actually can help you with this problem. And let me tell you who that is. Yeah, that's it's actually always fun. But yeah, Yeah. it's always fun. It's been great. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.